So in this video, I'm going to be looking at the benefits of introducing an HR um, department to an organisation, thinking about the benefits to the organisation, thinking about the benefits at a team level, and also thinking about the benefits to the individual employees, thinking about the behaviours that that can elicit in the employees. And then we'll also think about the barriers that can present themselves in terms of introducing an HR department. So why might it not be effective? Why might it not work? And then once we've, thought, once we've talked about the barriers, we can then think about how we might overcome those barriers. So let's look at the organisational level first. So we've always got to try and justify why HR is there, what purpose it serves. So thinking about the benefits to the organisation. So the HR department quite often can be accused of um, not really understanding what's going on in the rest of the business. But HR is so important um, that it spans across everything. And if you don't manage your staff effectively, it will have an impact on the organisation. So thinking about if you've got a good HR department that's functioning well and providing the right kind of services to the organisation, finding the right type of employees with the right skills, the right attitudes, the right behaviours, then what does that mean for the business? Well, it means you've got high levels of employee morale. So you've got happy employees who want to come to work, who are putting in additional effort. Um, probably linked to that, you will have higher levels of customer satisfaction because they're getting good quality service or good quality goods. They're um, being treated well by the staff, the, the staff that they have direct contact with. You have a unified workforce, so you're not looking at industrial action or disputes or there's less likelihood of there being conflict. You have a high calibre workforce, so you've got a workforce who are highly skilled, highly knowledgeable. Um, and as I said before, they've got the right attitude, so you've got good quality staff. Um, and because of the type of organisation that you've generated and the reputation you have for how you treat your staff, you're more likely to attract better quality workers as well. And because of that, because everything's working together and there's little or no conflict, there's more likelihood that the company will achieve its organisational objectives. So whatever the strategy is at an organisational level, that's all being implemented and that's all being achieved, which is obviously ultimately what senior management are looking for and even managers when they're um, working with their teams and trying to achieve the, the team goals, then the fact that they've got the right people in place will help them to achieve that. So thinking in particular, um, each of those different elements in turn, now going to look a little bit at um, the areas of HR that contribute directly to those things. Um, I'm not just going to read what's on the slide. So um, you know, please, please feel free to read through what's on the slides. But um, if you're looking at employee morale, then that obviously falls under the heading of employee relations because you're looking for a good relationship between the employer and the employee. You're looking for a good, healthy psychological contract where the expectations are being met, the employees feel trusted. Um, but you will also find that will link in with performance management because they've got clear objectives, they know what they're working towards, they'll be getting feedback about how they're doing, how they might be able to improve, where they're doing particularly well. Um, so performance management, employee relations are both going to be very important here. But recruitment and selection, as I've touched on already, if you actually make sure that you're employing the right people to start with, then you're going to bring in people who have the right personality, the right attitudes, um, but also if they don't have the skills then through learning and development, you'll make sure that they're being trained with the appropriate skills. Um, there's a saying that you can um, recruit for attitude, but you can train for skills. So um, making sure that you're recruiting people who are going to fit in with the company. So recruitment and selection is important. Training and development or learning and development are important as well because you need to figure out what the company needs. 
where the skills gaps perhaps are or knowledge gaps, making sure that when you're bringing people in that you have a robust induction program in place that will make sure that the employees know what's expected of them from the very beginning. And as I say, if they don't have the skills already that you'll provide training, which will make sure that they have those skills. Um, and finally, you will tie that in with pay and reward as well, that you will have employees who feel valued, who feel that they're being given a salary that's worth the effort that they're putting in. So all of these things contribute to good employee morale. If the employees feel valued, feel that they're not just a number, that they feel that they're they have a purpose within the organisation and that they can see what their purpose is and how they fit in to delivering the organisational objectives, then generally speaking, you will have employees who are going to be more engaged and more likely to have higher levels of morale. Customer satisfaction. Again, fitting in with learning and development, making sure that you train staff you know, if you've got customer say, uh, facing staff, make sure that the staff have training and customer service skills. Make sure that they have the, the skills, the training necessary to allow them to do their job competently. Um, performance management, again, depending on what kind of job it is, making sure that the performance objectives link to the tasks that are to be completed. So if you have someone working on a shop floor, for example, you may have sales targets, but that may also be tied up with how you interact with the customer, getting customer feedback. Um, so the performance management is going to be linked in with all of that, whether you have something linked to bonuses and how much is being produced but linked to quality as well or um, looking at customer engagement, customer satisfaction, the number of customer complaints, the customer feedback, all of those sorts of things are going to be really important. So all of those can be tied into performance management. Again, reward and recognition. If the employees are being rewarded for their correct behaviours, um, then the reward systems can support delivering good customer service and employee engagement, as I've talked about already, if employees are engaged, if they come to work and they're happy, they're motivated, they're committed, if they, if they're, if they are engaged, they're going to work harder, they're going to put in more effort and that will serve the customer's needs as well. You just think about it from your point of view. If you have a, a lecturer who is interested in their subject matter, who enjoys their job, who enjoys working with students, you're going to get a totally different experience than um, someone who perhaps is unhappy, um, who doesn't necessarily like their job, who feel disillusioned perhaps, then the customer experience is going to be very different. So how employees are treated doesn't does impact on customer satisfaction. So thinking about how to make your customers happy, you have to have motivated, engaged employees who have a high morale, a high employee morale. So these are these things are really, really important. And you can see that it's not just one thing within HR, it's lots of different things. It's about how all these different um, HR packages or HR activities complement and support each other. So for example, you can have performance management, you can set targets, you can set the objectives so the employees know what they're working towards, but by also having reward and recognition, it's a way of rewarding the employees once they achieve the objectives that have been set, recognising that they've achieved or gone beyond what's required. So again, reinforcing that the behaviours that are being demonstrated by the employees are appropriate and are the behaviours that you're looking for. So if you reward and reinforce those behaviours, you'll get more of the same. <clears throat> so unified workforce, um, <clears throat> as I said um, previously, this is about the lack of conflict, perhaps a lack of industrial action, those sorts of things. So obviously employee relations 
is going to fit in there as well, making sure that, you know, if there are problems, if there are issues, the employees know how to deal with it, know how it can be addressed and trust that management will actually deal with it if they do have a problem. Learning and development, <clears throat> again, training training the employees, but also training the managers so that they know how to deal with conflict, they know how to deal with disputes. Um, probably under L&D as well, you could have team building activities. So you have everybody working together. Culture, culture within the organisation is really, really important. So you have to make sure that the culture is supportive of um, an inclusive environment so there's not going to be discrimination and if discrimination were to occur it's going to be challenged um, performance management again making sure that you have the right objectives that you're measuring the performance against the, right, the correct criteria and again reward and recognition so you're rewarding the correct behaviours you're rewarding um what you want and the culture you want to create. If you were introducing a new culture in an organisation, for example, you would then want to make sure that you tie your rewards systems and the recognition systems in with the behaviours that you're trying to promote and encourage. So again, all of these things fit together. It's not employee relations and L&D and culture. Yes, these are separate activities, but they are interrelated. So don't forget to tie these things together and don't be worried when, when you're thinking about these things and thinking that there's overlap. There should be overlap there. Okay, so again, a high caliber workforce, if you're looking for um, the best staff, the most highly skilled, the most motivated, then you need to make sure that you've got the correct strategies in place to attract the right kind of staff and retain those staff, once you've got them, you, you want to make sure that they don't go out your door. You want to make sure they don't go to the competition. So talent planning will be identifying who you need. What are you going to be doing in the future? What kind of staff do you need to do that? What kind of attitudes are you looking for? What skills do you require? And again, once you've done that, that may be about recruitment, but it could also be about providing training so that you're developing the skills in-house that you need or um, training, developing the, the behaviours and the attitudes, making sure that employees understand why particular attitudes are appropriate or are not appropriate. It's really important for things like diversity and inclusion so that people are aware what is acceptable within the organisation and what isn't, and also what the consequences might be where inappropriate behaviours are being demonstrated. So talent planning, learning and development, again, performance management, if you want to attract and retain high calibre staff, you have to make sure that they're being um, rewarded. You need to make sure that the they know that the behaviours that, that, they're, that they're demonstrating, how they're working, is going to be recognised. And again, through performance management, you're making it really, really clear about what is acceptable, what are the standards that they should be achieving, what, what are they actually being measured against within the workplace as well. So these are all really, really important. <clears throat> so... All of that should be working towards the achievement of the organisational objectives. Um, and ultimately, that should always be in the back of everybody's minds. What is a company trying to achieve? And as an individual, what's my role in doing that? Um, so for the college, the idea is to produce, create, a workforce for the future, that by the end of your course, you are able to go into the workplace and be ready for work, that you have the right skills. So that's the college's objectives, that's its aim. Um, and then my job as an individual lecturer and the, the job of all your lecturers is to make sure that we're giving you the correct knowledge, skills, training that allows you to go into the workplace to do that. So 
if that's what we're trying to achieve, how do we do that in terms of the HR processes? So performance management. When um, I have my appraisal, my line manager and I, we sit and we look at the college's objectives and we tailor my objectives to how I'm going to help the college achieve its goals. So the two have to be connected. So even at an individual level, that individual's objective should still be linking back into the organisation's objectives um, so that you're working in the same direction. Again, employee relations. If the company wants to have, now this it doesn't, it's not listed here, but I would say culture should be in here as well. If uh, an organisation is trying to develop, um, we have a learning strategy that is about creativity, creativity and learning. And um, the idea is that we should have flexibility in terms of how we design our classes, how we deliver our classes so that... Um, we can use what we deem to be the most appropriate activities and that that will also mean that when you go into the workplace you're more likely to engage with processes you're more likely to be able to come up with ideas on your own because of encouraging that creativity um, so performance management can be linked to how we do that but if we have a high level culture that's saying this is what you want to do, this is what you want to achieve. But at the operational level where you're dealing with line managers and you're dealing with the day-to-day -day activities, if that's very, very controlled and very rigid and saying you have to do things in a particular way, then that's conflicting with the other cultures the other strategy of the organisation. So for employee relations, it's about trying to make sure that everything complements each other, that the, the different strategies support each other and what's happening at the organisational level, at the team level and at the individual level are all supporting each other, that you don't have objectives at the different levels in conflict with each other. So that's harmony is really, really important. So normally employee relations is about the harmony between managers and employees, but um, it's also within the organisation. So employee relations, if you've got conflict, if staff go on strike, for example, you're not going to be able to achieve your objectives because it's disrupting the, the normal flow within the organisation. It's, it's interrupting the production line effectively um, obviously if lecturers go on strike then you're not getting your, your lecturing input you're not getting your teaching and that will impact on the quality of your teaching of your learning rather um, learning and development again if the company's objectives are for creative learning for the college then the HR department has to make sure that the staff are developed in a way that allows them to be creative, to explore different options. So you need to make sure that you're giving the staff the skills, whether it's particular skills that allow you to do a job, so being trained in a particular technique, or developing the confidence in the employees that they can go off and explore, that they can try things. And that can be quite difficult. So sometimes it can be formal training courses but sometimes it could be something like mentoring coaching to help develop the individual as well again recruitment and selection you want to employ if you're looking to employ new staff you want to make sure that the staff are going to fit in with your culture they're going to share in the values and the ethos of the organization so again how you recruit the type of people you recruit you have to make sure that you're developing um, clear job descriptions that outline exactly what you're looking for, that you're recruiting from the right places and that your recruitment, your selection process, the questions you ask at interview, the criteria that you're assessing the candidates against, you have to make sure that all of these complement and will support the organisational objectives. 
So hopefully that all makes sense to you. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on from the benefits to the organisation of having an HR department, we're now going to look at um, how this can impact on um, the performance within the team. So probably touched on a lot of this already, but if you have an effective recruitment and selection process, um, if you involve the team and not just the line manager in designing the job description, get input from everybody. What exactly does a team do? What, what should they be doing? What do they want from the person that's going to join their team? Um, if you've got teams that are struggling because they're they're not they don't have enough people in the team, make sure that you get that team back up to full capacity as quickly as possible so you're not waiting wasting time. Most of these looking looking down through the bullet points for the effective recruitment and selection, I've talked about all of these already. So, you know, how well the team performs is, is going to be down to how well they get on together. Are you bringing in people that are going to fit in with the team? Do the team have the right number of people? Um, and again, you want a team that's pretty stable. You don't want high turnover within the team either because that can then in indicate that there's perhaps problems. Um, and as it says in the final bullet point there as well, employee relations is really important because you want to retain the team members. You don't want high turnover. You don't want to be constantly recruiting to fill new people into the team. So if that were happening, you'd have to look at why people are leaving. And is it a, an employee relations issue? Is there um, problems with the dynamics in the team? Are there poor communication? So look to find out what you can do to help improve the functioning within the team. Again, learning and development, um, making sure that the team has the training that they need to be able to do their job, but also maybe think about um, how the individual team members are performing. Is someone underperforming? Do they need a little bit of extra support? Um, but also within the team, you may have some multi-skilling so everybody in the team can understand and can do the other roles within the team as well so that although you have a team made up of different people that they can support each other by undertaking the the tasks of the other team members as well. Diversity within the team is really important because that's about making sure that you have a range of different people that are coming in with different ideas, different ways of thinking, different ways of looking at things. So if you have a team where they've been working together for a long time, they all know each other very well, then yes, they're going to get on well, they're going to be harmonious, but they're going to think in the same way. So introducing someone new into the team, bringing in some diversity, might challenge some of the status quo and some of the the thinking within the team so it may generate some new ideas which may help the team as well and that may also then help the team perform better. And reward and recognition is really important with teams. If you have a rewards process or a reward system that supports a team it will focus on team bonuses, team benefits, so you're rewarding the team and not the individuals within the team. If you have a team where you're trying to get the team to work closely together, to be supportive, to work collaboratively, and you have a rewards package that rewards individuals and perhaps creates tension, competition, conflict potentially within the team, then that's not going to be beneficial for the team. So when you're designing a rewards package, it's really important that it supports the team. Right, so I've touched earlier as well on how the different HR activities that I've been looking at can impact on employee behaviour. Um, but Specifically, you're thinking about things like their levels of motivation. How motivated are they? Do they actually want to get up and come to work in the morning? Do they um, go that extra mile? 
how committed are they? Do they want to stay with the company? Are they loyal? Are they looking for another job? So the, that commitment is really important as well. So you want motivated employees. You want mot- you want employees that are going to be loyal and committed, that are going to stay with the organisation and want to stay with the organisation because they think it's a good company, not because they can't get a job somewhere else. Psychological contract, we have discussed so much, but it is so important that if you have a healthy psychological contract, you're going to have happier employees, they're going to work harder, they're going to work to a better standard as well. Um, And employee engagement will also impact on um, employee behaviour as well. So if you have employees that are not engaged, and that perhaps a psychological contract is not that healthy. They're going to be less motivated. They're going to be less committed. They may demonstrate higher absence, poor quality work, um, perhaps bad attitude. There may be conflict. There may be, you know, at its extreme, there could be fighting and arguing and lots and lots of issues. So you're not just talking about... Um, employees not putting in the same level of effort. You may have high absence, high turnover because the better employees won't then want to stay with the company and they'll go and work somewhere else where they may feel more appreciated and more valued. Um, And obviously this is going to link in a lot with um, motivational theories as well because it helps us to understand what employees are looking for and what they need and what we have here is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you should all be familiar with. <clears throat> so just as a recap, Maslow has a hierarchy of needs where you start at the bottom of the pyramid with the physiological needs. And as as humans, we all strive to satisfy our first level needs. So the physiological needs, we want to make sure that we have food, water, sleep, that we're getting those basic needs. So if you're really, really hungry, um, you're not going to focus on anything else until you've dealt with that hunger. And that's really what that's saying. So once you've dealt with your hunger, you're not thirsty, you're not hungry, you've had sleep, you can then move on to the safety and security needs. Um, And that can be uh, a safe place to work job security, those sorts of things. Um, So again, if you're worrying about are there going to be redundancies, you know, at the moment this is going to be really relevant because lots of employees might have been quite happy, but we're back in lockdown. Employees are being put on furlough. Companies are making redundancies. A lot of people who may have been quite secure and quite happy in the past year have possibly dropped down to the safety and security level because they're worrying about their jobs, they're worrying about their family, they're worrying about their health as well. So if that's what people are worrying about, then the motivation is to meet those needs to satisfy those needs and that can be really difficult particularly for employers because how can you guarantee to someone that they're not going to be put on furlough that the company's not going to struggle so much that they're going to have to make redundancies none of us can guarantee that we're not going to catch covid and there's so much uncertainty we don't know how bad it's going to be if you do catch it um and Obviously, there's hope with the vaccine and things like that. So there is some safety, some reassurance coming. But until those needs are met, we're not going to move on to the next level. So that's that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And employers need to think about what are the things that are going to be concerning employees? What are their needs? How do we, how do we motivate our employees? Well, we need to focus on what they need, what level in the hierarchy are there. Are they, and then we as employers need to look to see how can we actually satisfy those needs. As I say, some needs are perhaps easier to satisfy than others, but the argument is that you won't move on to the next level until you've satisfied the needs at the previous level. So 
this is just a, a range of different ways that we can actually make sure that um, we're doing the right things from an HR perspective to get the right kind of behaviours out of the employees. So making sure that you've got good employee engagement strategies in place, that you're listening to the employees, that you um, do staff surveys, that managers are open to their employees, that they will listen to their employees. Um, <clears throat> communication is two-way, so it's not just the company telling the employees what's happening, um, that they listen to the employees as well, they take on board their, their comments, their feedback, and act on it. Um, and if they can't act on it, to provide feedback and explain why not. Um, we need to have good leadership, you know, have good team leaders, good managers who are good at managing people who have the correct management skills as well. Making sure that you're providing learning and development opportunities. There's a lot of research that suggests nowadays a lot of people looking for work. Um, learning and development opportunities is right up there at the top. Um, so it's something that's really, really important to people when they're looking for employment as well. Make sure that you're offering the correct reward and recognition. As I've talked about already, you use your rewards and recognition packages to reinforce and support the behaviours that you want within the company. So if you want particular behaviours, make sure that your rewards are going to reinforce the behaviours that you're looking for. Make sure that the employees have a job that they feel is worthwhile is something that they can be proud of, um, that they're actually achieving something from it, they feel that they're adding value, so that they, it's a job that they get meaning out of, that they feel the job serves a purpose, but is also something that will give them some satisfaction to make sure they've got a positive working environment. Now that can just be, if you think about Hertzberg's two-factor theory, um, the hygiene factors, making sure that the employees have a good working environment with tools that work, that they ha have enough warmth, that it's bright enough so they can see what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> if that doesn't work, then you're never going to motivate your employees. So make sure that the fundamentals are, are addressed first as well. And that your policies and procedures are consistent and fair. If people don't feel that they're being treated fairly, then again, that's going to affect their motivation levels. And that you're consistent, that they're, they're applied the same way with everybody. So um, there's no signs of favouritism, for example, when staff are being managed. And if all of that comes together, and it's all being done effectively, then what the company should see um, are these benefits. Higher productivity and performance, so the staff are working better, they're being more productive, they're performing to a higher standard, better quality probably. You'll have good retention, so you won't be losing staff. You'll have lower absence levels, so your sick rate should fall. Um, and because everybody knows where everybody stands, knows what's expected from them, and you've got good employee relations, there should be less grievances, and you shouldn't have to be disciplining your staff as much either. Um, if you've got diversity and inclusiveness and the right kind of culture that encourages creativity and innovation, then you'll have employees that will come up with ideas. They'll not be frightened to express their ideas because they'll, they'll not think, well, I'm just um, a factory worker and I'm not going to be listened to. They'll feel that everybody has a voice and they will be happy to express themselves. Um, overall, because your employees are more performing better, the company should also be performing better as well. It gives the company competitive advantage. Um, employees can make a big difference for the company. And um, as you'll see from a later slide, employees are the greatest resource of the company. And they're the only one that's very, very difficult for another company to copy and to imitate. They can copy your processes, but they're not going to have exactly the same staff. 
So that that character of the staff, the combination of the different people you've brought together, the different behaviours, the different attitudes, the different values that come with your employees, that's very difficult to copy. So that will be something that if you've got the right kind of behaviours, the right kind of attitudes, that will add to competitive advantage for the company. As I've said already as well, employee engagement, um, employee morale, if you've got a happy workforce um, who feel valued, who feel that they serve a purpose in the organisation, you're going to have increased loyalty and commitment from the employees and linked to that as well, <clears throat> they will feel safe and secure with the organisation. And I think at the moment, any employee that feels that Although companies can't guarantee security at the moment, um, if the company is being open, is communicating with them, is talking to them and involving them in the processes, then they're more likely to still feel safe, as safe as they can, and they'll feel loyalty towards their organisation, loyalty towards their um, management even in times of uncertainty. So I think in times of uncertainty, those communication channels and that side of things is even more important than under normal circumstances. <clears throat> so thinking now about the barriers to implementing and maintaining an effective HR function. A lot of the obvious things, you know, if you don't have an HR team who don't have the resources, who don't have enough staff, or um, they don't understand the organisation, that's going to have an impact. How can HR support the business if they don't understand the business? How can they support the business if they don't have enough people, they don't have the, the funding to allow them to deliver the training that's required or whatever it is? Um, <clears throat> If they're just operational, if they don't actually have any involvement at a strategic level, if HR's role is to support the business, deliver its strategy, HR has to be involved at that strategic level um, so that it can understand what's trying to be achieved and it can have an input in terms of um, what the company is trying to achieve to make sure that it's then being achieved correctly and HR is able to make sure that the company has the support it requires. Generally speaking, something like this would require a lot of change and Lewin's change, ma change management model is, is just a model for how we deal with change, um, the process that we take the employees through. But resistance to change is really, really important. People don't like change generally. Nobody likes change. Um, and a lot of the time, the resistance to change comes through a fear of not knowing what's going to happen, how it's going to impact on you. So a lot of times that resistance can be overcome by communication. So clear communication and going on to the next one is a commitment from senior management. So if management show that they're committed to the changes being driven through and with the HR function, if they show that they're committed to the HR function, they believe it does serve a purpose and it is going to help the organisation, it's more likely to um, operate more effectively. So if senior management don't support the HR department, that's going to be fed down through more junior level management who aren't going to turn to HR and are not going to look to HR for support. So the commitment from senior management is um, really an issue. Equally, getting management buy-in um, from middle, middle management as well as uh, another major issue that if management don't want to do what HR is telling them to do or think they know better or think that HR is just interfering, then these are obviously all barriers as well. So that relationship between management and HR is really important. So, so far we've really looked at um, what they can do to help support employees and make sure that the company is getting the most out of its employees, but the management themselves have got to be on board. They've got to see the benefits 
the HR offers um, and sometimes the communication needs to be with management as well. And again, if senior management are buying in, the middle management will pick up on that and it's more likely to be um, more effective as well. So departmental conflict could be conflict within the HR department or um, conflict between departments. Sometimes it can be managers want to do something that HR is telling them they can't do, usually sacking someone um, without, go <clears throat> without going through procedures. But um, sometimes it can just be that managers want to do their own thing and perhaps if the HR department is just being introduced, management may feel that HR's taking some of their roles away, although to be honest it's usually the other way around. HR is trying to get management to be involved in the processes, but management just want HR to do it and don't want any involvement directly themselves. So addressing those conflicts is, is quite important as well. Obviously, just what I've touched on, the the fear of job security. You know, if managers have previously been doing lots of HR duties, they may worry that introducing an HR department is going to take those jobs away from them, that if HR does X, Y and Z, am I going to be needed anymore? But more widely, HR is seen as being the baddie when it comes to redundancies or if there's going to be mergers that, you know, does that mean that we're not going to need as many people? Again, could lead to, excuse me, could lead to redundancies. So job security itself is a barrier to HR being able to um, <clears throat> do their job effectively. If the culture is not correct, if you've got a culture of disengagement, then HR trying to improve productivity, improve efficiency, make things better is going to be more difficult. So they would need to look at how do we turn that culture around? How do we stop staff from feeling disengaged? Linking into some of the stuff I've talked about already as well, the lack of understanding of the role of HR. So again, often managers don't actually understand what HR's role is, what they're there to do. So there's a lot of education required. Poor evaluation of what HR does, that you know, perhaps someone's previous experience of an HR department has not been effective, has not been very good. So they will be more resistant to the introduction of an HR department because they'll not feel that it has any value. So they're probably not all the barriers, but there's certainly a lot of barriers as to the introduction of an HR department and how it can be maintained and how it can deliver an effective HR service. If you don't have the support of management, for example, HR is never really going to be able to do a very good job um, <clears throat> and it needs to be able to convince management that it is a valuable service for the organisation. So how do we overcome this? Some of this I've, I've touched on already, things like communication, really, really important. Be transparent about why you're there, what you're trying to achieve. Make sure that you're reliable, that you're consistent, that you back up and justify whatever it is that you're doing um, and that you're always looking to um, improve. So, you know, make sure that HR itself is always reflecting on what we've been doing, how we're delivering, how we're being perceived. Developing those relationships with managers is really, really important. And when they do get something right, it needs to be celebrated. It needs to be recognised. So that, that sort of reward and recognition comes in here as well. That um, perhaps not rewards, but um, celebrating the successes and recognising the achievements that have been made. So hopefully you have found all of this interesting. And as I say, I had a slide that basically says what we're saying about competitive advantage. 
And that is the end of the video. So hopefully you have found it of interest and please feel free to post if you have any queries.